Kamu bisa nak tinggal barang nanti kantor. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As we say, follow us. I hope you are all in a good condition in this pandemic situation. Welcome to MCU Online. This is our online meeting to the pandemic condition. We hope that this pandemic will be over soon, and we look forward to at another MCU Live meeting, and hope. To see all of you again. Today, webinar sponsored by Astellas Indonesia will discuss many interesting topics with our honor speaker. We have four topics and four speakers. To the speaker, Dr. Paksi Satya Grahan and Dr. Taufik Nur Budaya from Department of Urology, Faculty of Medicine, Brawijaya University, Saiful Anwar Hospital, Malang, Indonesia. And third speaker, uh, Dr. Jose Benito Abraham from uh, National Kidney and Transplant Institute, Philippines. And fourth speaker, Dr. Eka Yuda Rahman from Ulin Hospital, Banjarmasin. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Besut Darianto will be moderator for this MCA online. I'm from Department of Urology, Faculty of Medicine, Bawijaya University, Saiful Anwar Hospital, Malang, Indonesia. I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Joseph Benito Abraham, as our guest speaker from National Kidney and Transplantation Institute, Philippines, for sparing his time to share knowledge and experiences with us. Good afternoon, Dr. Joben. How are you? Doing great. Good afternoon. Thank you, sir. Okay. Before we begin, just a reminder for CEO point and e certificate will be delivered to you by email after you will fill out the Google form and all questions for the day meeting and be written down in message box on your screen. Okay. Today we'll be start the webinar with the title Alpha Blocker for Large Treatment. Are they all the same? By Dr. Paksi Satya Graha. Dr. Paksi Satya Graha is my staff in Department of Urology, Faculty of Medicine, Brawijaya University, Saiful Anwar Hospital. Dr. Paksi is in the Division Trauma and Deconstructive Urology. Dr. Faxi, the time is yours. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Besut. Uh, good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My good friend, Dr. Joben, thank you very much for uh, attending and accepting our invitation in our uh, Malang Continuing Urology Education. It's such a, an honor for us 
and it's a great uh, a great opportunity for us to learn from you again. But unfortunately, the first lecture would be uh, would be delivered by me. <laughs> we will we will uh, we will talk about I will talk about uh, alpha blocker for large treatment. Are they all the same? Thank you very much, Dr. Busut, for uh, introducing me. And um, this is our seventh MCV online. And unfortunately, this year would be the, I think it would be the year that we could not visit each other. So I kind of miss Manila. I miss the balut and also all the great food in Manila and also the traffic in Manila. But uh, we just uh, have to be safe and stay at home during this pandemic. I'll say hello to all the friends from uh, Philippines and also uh, in India, who, 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 uh, general practitioners who also attended this meeting, Alpha Blocker for Lutz Treatment are all the same. Um, the contents would be some introduction and condition behind lower unit tract symptoms, prevalence, diagnosis, treatment, and et cetera. So the definition of the lower unit tract symptoms uh, is a complaint, uh, a common complaint in adult men. And the problem is this is causing a major impact in the quality of life and also have a substantial economic burden. And there are so many guidelines in the world, the European guideline, the American guideline, uh, who uh, assess and also suggested the treatment to, for, to, to treat a lower unit tract symptom for men above 40 years old. And lower unit tract symptoms, as we know, could be divided into storage, voiding, and also post-micturition symptoms. We will discuss about that later. And uh, increasing awareness of lower, lower unit tract symptoms and uh, storage symptoms in particular is uh, warranted to discuss uh, management options that could increase quality of life. So these are the classification of the symptoms there are. We know that there are storage symptoms. Is this uh, irritative symptoms? There are frequency, nocturia, and urgency. And some of the patients also uh, experience urinary incontinence. And there are also voiding symptoms, hesitancy, intermittency, slow stream, uh, spraying, straining, and also terminal dribbling. And the last one is the post mixturing symptoms. This is the basic a knowledge for the general practitioners. And as we know, lower unit tract symptoms is not only caused by bladder prostatic enlargement or bladder outlet obstruction. Um, in the old days, these symptoms uh, used to be known as prostatism symptoms. But now we understand there are so many different uh, factors that could cause lower unit tract symptoms, such as BPH, prostatitis, even distal urethrostone, there are some bladder tumor could also uh, mimicking the symptoms, stricture causing the bladder outlet obstruction, uh, foreign bodies such as stones and others, uh, double J stands also could be causing lower urinary tract symptoms, estrogen deficiency, UTI, and etc. So uh, we have to differentiate what caused the lower urinary tract symptoms. And as we know, the prevalence. There's an EPIC study conducted in Canada, Germany, Italy, Sweden, and United Kingdom. Almost 20,000 individual uh, men above 18 years old. It shows out that more than 60% reported lower urinary tract symptoms. And in my own practice, following this result, the first question that I would ask my patient regarding lower, lower urinary tract symptoms is nocturia because many patients are not aware of other symptoms like a frequency or slow stream or straining. They even, especially the Indonesian patient, they feel that this is normal uh, having a lower stream when they are get old. But when we ask nocturia, we know that the patient have uh, significant symptoms. So nocturia would be defined as the uh, voiding, uh, waking up from uh, sleeping to void more than once a night. So most men have both voiding and uh, storage symptoms. There are uh, a study, Epilets. This study was uh, conducted in the US, UK, and also the Sweden, in Sweden. Almost 15,000 
men included above 40 years old, only th around 30% does not have a lower urinary tract symptoms. 70% have these symptoms. 24% or a quarter of the population have all of the three symptoms, voiding, storage, post-mixtrogen symptoms, but most of these patients have two or more symptoms. So this is very important. So men above 40 years old, 70% have uh, voiding symptoms. That's what happened in US, UK, and Sweden. What about in Asia? There are actually not much, uh, not much data, especially in the Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, but there are some paper from the from Taiwan, Hong Kong, that also only 37% of males above 40 does not have uh, lower urinary tract symptoms. About uh, more than 60% uh, have these symptoms. While the most and the prevalence, of course, it. It's uh, increasing uh, according to uh, symptoms occur. And also, lower urinary tract symptoms also affects the sexual function in Asia men. This is a, a, a paper from uh, China, Taiwan, and South Korea. Um, the, 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 the study suggested that LUTs is prevalent in above than 60% of Asian males and also associated with a reduced quality of life and sexual function. So this is becoming a, a serious problem for men all over the world. How to diagnose? Everyone uh, already aware of how to examine, how to do a proper history taking. And then uh, we could do some questionnaire like uh, IPSS, International Prosthetic Symptom Score. Uh, we, could, we should also have to do urinalysis, urophlometry, measurement of post void residual, and for screening of prostate cancer in some selective patient, PSA, could also be performed. And also another uh, important thing is to perform a, a proper bladder diary. So we could differentiate whether this patient has uh, predominantly uh, storage symptoms or uh, voiding symptoms, or even if we, uh, we have to rule out the nocturnal polyuria condition. This is the uh, international prostate symptom score, as we know. This one is in Indonesian. So, but there are so there are the original is in English. So, all of the medical doctor all over the world could use this uh, questionnaire. We are all aware that the mild symptoms zero to seven, moderate eight to nineteen, and severe symptoms above twenty. And how how to treat? As we see, before the era of the endo urology uh, surgery, it was open surgery. It was a big surgery a bloody with a uh, full of a uh, lot of complication. It started in 1970, introduced transurethral resection of the prostate that still being used until today. But medically in 1976, phenoxybenzamine was introduced to be uh, re effective for the treatment of BPH, regardless the, the, the high rate of side effects. In 1992, uh, Alpha, 5 alpha reductase inhibitor was also launched in UK to uh, non selectively block 5 alpha uh, reductase. But a uh, long acting selective alpha blocker, Tamsulosin, was firstly launched in 1998. In 2002, a uh, combination between uh, the stasrid and alpha blockers is also uh, introduced. And there are other medications that was reported to be effective to treat a lower urinary tract symptoms in men with uh, benign prostatic enlargement, such as PDE5 inhibitor and also beta-3 agonist. And I believe in the future, the research is still goes on. And how to, uh, to treat and how's the algorithm? There's a very nice algorithm. This is uh, written in the uh, European guideline if the patient have a bothersome symptoms, whether the patient has a, a nocturnal polyuria predominant, then we should go for a vasopressin analog. But if the patient have not no a nocturnal polyuria predominant, whether the storage is or the voiding is dominant, 
if the prostate is above 40 uh, milliliters, then uh, we should think about alpha blockers and, uh, and uh, uh, 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. If, if the prostate is big, 5-alpha reductase inhibitor and uh, alpha blockers. If not, not that big, we could consider the alpha blockers of PDE5 inhibitors. So these are the algorithm uh, to treat the BPH who has symptomatic. And I, want just, I just want to emphasize that the treatment for uh, prostate hyperplasia or prostate enlargement is very individual. It, it takes a careful examination. It takes a careful history taking uh, about which symptoms or which complaints does the patient have most. So we treat according to the, to the complaints. And in EAU was, uh, was mentioned that uh, alpha blockers are effective in reducing uh, urinary symptoms and increasing peak urinary flow because alpha blockers has a, a, a fast acting and uh, alpha zosin, terazosin and doxazosin statistically significant increase the risk of developing vascular related events compared with uh, placebo. And uh, alpha zosin, doxazosin, tamsulosin, terazosin exposure has been associated with in a risk of IFIS. And the recommendation, um, the ejaculatory dysfunction is significantly more common in alpha-1 blocker with placebo. So we are looking for uh, uh, effective drugs who have less uh, adverse effects. But the recommendation still, alpha blockers could be given to treat men with moderate to severe LUTs. Also in Indonesia, the Indonesian Urology Association has also uh, uh, published uh, guidelines for Indonesian uh, urologists and Indonesian general practitioner that alpha blocker could be given to the patients of BPH with the uh, mild and uh, severe symptoms. So what about alpha blockers? The first alpha blockers was introduced in 1976 uh, by Dr. Marco Kane. But the problem is phenoxybenzamine has a very high adverse event. The high rates of tiredness, dizziness, impaired ejaculation, nasal uh, stuffiness, and hypotensions. Since this uh, alpha blocker is a non-selective alpha blockers. And um, then in 1980s, Lepro and Safiro characterized, they identified the alpha-1 and alpha-2 adrenal receptors in human prostate. The contractile properties of prostate smooth muscle were uh, mediated primarily by alpha-1. And prazosin is the first short-acting selective alpha blockers developed by uh, for hypertension treatment. Have a better tolerance, but require a titration and multiple daily dose. And then in 1992, uh, terazosin is also uh, introduced. It's a well-tolerated uh, adverse event. There are still some uh, problem with asthenia, fatigue, postural hypotension, dizziness, and somnolence. In 1998, in newer generation, tamsulosin, this is a long acting subtype selective alpha-1 blockers was approved by the FDA. And it has uh, also adverse effect, but it's low, uh, it has lower adverse effect. There are some dizziness, asthenia, and ejaculatory dysfunction, but this, this drug has a dose dependent, but no need for titration and less postural hypertension. So it has less adverse effect. alpha zosin was introduced also in the same time, the four selective alpha-1 blockers, um, but this one also caused the ejaculatory dysfunction. At the end, from Japan was introduced uh, psilocybin in to, uh, 2009. Uh, but the problem also, this drug also a very high uh, incidence of ejaculatory dis uh, dysfunction. So if we look, we just let's just leave terazosin, doxazosin, alfuzosin. So now the recent uh, medication is basically tamsulosin and psilocybin. Uh, what makes the difference between these two is tamsulosin now has a modified release of formulation. Uh, it has the same equal uh, efficacy and effect. And uh, psilocybin is basically a super selective, but uh, psilocybin have uh, more ejaculatory dysfunction. And there are some off-label uh, therapy using psilocybin for male contraception. So there's a, there's a paper from our colleagues in, uh, in uh, Bali and also from Surabaya, the effectiveness of tamsulosin in BPH 
with a patient LUTs, a multi-center cohort retrospective study. It shows that uh, Tamsulosin has a statistically significant improvement of total IPSS, quality of life, IPSS voiding, and IPSS storage. If we compare the Tamsulosin and Silodosin, it has uh, equally effective. Both are, say, uh, are, are equally effective, but we could see that the problem with uh, using psilocybin, the prevalence of uh, abnormal ejaculation is a lot higher in psilocybin. So uh, for patient who, want, who still wants to have a, a, a normal uh, ejaculation, so tamsulosin is uh, the choice to treat their BPH. There's a meta-analysis of cardiovascular in studies with uh, uh, various alpha blockers in patient with loss of BPH, the, all alpha blockers can cause hypotension, particularly upon initiation treatment. But with the alpha-1 selective tamsulosin having a smaller risk for vasodilatation related adverse effect than non-selective alpha blockers. So even when my patient asks when to, to, to consume the drugs, I would say with, in, in most cases, I could say you could, you could take the medication anytime you like. It doesn't, it doesn't require to drink it before sleeping at night, but since the adverse effect for postural hypertension is very low for tamsulosin. Okay, the efficacy for long-term, also tamsulosin is uh, quite effective for si until six years. It was sustaining the, the condition and a quite low of uh, side effect. And tamsulosin 0.4 milligram demonstrated a good tolerability and safety. There are some small adverse effects. Uh, there are uh, infection, accidental injury, and then other adverse effect is ejaculation abnormal, uh, 8%, syncope only 1%, and very low postural hypotension. So this is uh, considered reasonable. So in the summary, a lower urinary tract symptoms due to BPH consists of uh, two main symptoms, even though there are three actually, voiding and storage. And storage is the most common symptoms that was complained by the patient, especially nocturia. Uh, the management should be individualized according to the cause of the lower urinary tract symptoms. If it is BPH, then we go for the algorithm uh, for BPH treatment. There are published guidelines describe the correct care pathways, alpha-1, and uh, receptor and uh, alpha blockers is recommended for the first line treatment of LUTs. Among the alpha blockers, tamsulosin has a good efficacy and toler tolerability. So uh, that's all for me, and we could discuss about this later. Thank you very much, Dr. Basud. Thank you very much, Dr. Faxi, for your nice presentation. I think it's very clear. Our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Taufik. Nur Budaya, he will deliver Mira background of variety breeder and quality of life. Dr. Taufik is our staff in Department of Urology, Faculty of Medicine, Brawijaya University, Saiful Anwar Hospital Malang, in Division of Oncology Urology. Dr. Taufik, time is yours. Thank you, Dr. Basud. Thank you for the committee for the opportunity to me to uh, explain a little bit about the OAB. And thank you also for uh, Dr. Joben for uh, our invitation to uh, giving a lecture uh, in uh, our meeting today. Okay, I will. Yes, uh, you can see my slide. I think. Okay, uh, I will talk about the mirror background, OAB, and a quality of life. Uh, the, of the OAB uh, diagnosis and the treatment of uh, OAB. The definition of OAB or Operative Bladder by International Continent Society. Uh, the Operative Bladder is a syndrome. Uh, consists of urinary ur urgency, usually accompanied by uh, increasing of daytime frequency or nocturia with uh, or without a urinary incontinence. 
absence of urinary tract infection or another detectable disease. So if we have a chart, uh, the OAB symptom or OAB syndrome, uh, the first one is must be urinary urgency and then plus frequency or nocturia and uh, with or without uh, urinary incontinence and must be no urinary tract infection or disease. We must con uh, exclude the UTI or uh, another disease uh, besides to uh, diagnose with overactive bladder. The current ICS terminology for urgency, this, uh, uh, urgency is uh, complaint, sudden complaint desire to pass urine uh, with difficult to defer. So we cannot uh, defer, uh, we, we urinate. And then the increased daytime frequency, uh, we know that uh, voiding more frequently during working hours and then previously. And the nocturia, as uh, the Dr. Pakti said, uh, we waking up uh, in the night from uh, our sleep to get the void. Said, and more than once, this is nocturia. And then uh, urinary. The prevalence of OAB syndrome. Uh, in the worldwide, uh, all population, women and women, is about uh, 11 uh, percent, and uh, men alone is about uh, 12 percent, and women less than uh, 10 percent is about uh, 9 percent. And uh, in Asia, surprisingly, that uh, we have a high number of uh, all uh, all the population we said that uh, maybe 21 uh, percent with OAB and men this is higher and this is 22 or 23 uh, percent patient with OAB and uh, for women population is uh, above uh, 19 percent of OAB patient in Asia you know that uh, prevalence of OAB increasing with age so if we have uh, more than nine we have 27.9% uh, uh, incident of OAB in uh, Taiwan. So uh, OAB symptom found a fact in one in five individual aged more than 40 in uh, China, Taiwan, and South Korea and becoming more common with increasing of age. And increasing symptom severity associated with lower sexual and women. This is the uh, prevalence of uh, UAB symptom. The higher is uh, frequency is about 85%, and then urgency is 45%, uh, and then urgency urinary incontinence is about uh, 36%. Uh, and then the combination uh, combination symptoms like frequency and urgency is about uh, 7%, uh, and then uh, three of uh, is about three uh, percent. So three percent patient with OAB have frequency, urgency, and incontinence. So uh, impact of OAB in uh, quality of life. So uh, OAB has significant negative impact in daily activities, uh, mental health, and uh, sexual function. So in the uh, men, both and men and women, we have. Uh, Three studies, EPIC, EPILUT, and MILSOM, said uh, the bother some level uh, 45, uh, 44 until 65 uh, percent, and uh, for a woman is about uh, 53 until 68 uh, uh, percent uh, decrease of uh, quality of life. And uh, in the Asia, yeah, in the South Korea, China, and uh, Taiwan. Uh, the, uh, the study said that there is a decreasing of health related quality of life and sexual quality of life with increasing symptom severity due to uh, overactive bladder. So we have uh, this chart uh, from Ocoin and Lee uh, that's uh, in the uh, published in the 2008 and 2015 said that more uh, one uh, symptom. Uh, there is one symptom, the quality uh, score is uh, 95, and then uh, adding uh, one symptom, there is uh, lowering the quality of life of the patient. And the five symptom, we have the quality uh, of life score is uh, 80. 
or you be in uh, quality of life in Korea, uh, if uh, we have uh, incontinence uh, episode more than uh, four times a uh, week, a uh, day, uh, we have uh, lowering a quality of life. Uh, then uh, if we compare with uh, no uh, incontinence. Impact of AB on patient uh, quality of life. Uh, then other is uh, about the psychological and uh, emotional uh, impact. Uh, in patient having OAB symptom, 32 patient reporting depressed and depressed and uh, 28 uh, uh, so OIB patient have a greater level of anxiety and uh, embarrassment or shame uh, if we compare with the normal uh, person. But uh, if the OAB come with incontinence, it's more more terrible for the emotional well-being patient. So how we uh, the initial diagnosis process we. Uh, we must uh, compare to the history taking, physical examination, and the basic one is urinalysis. And then optional, uh, optional additional diagnostic measure. And the first one, the urine, urine culture to uh, conclude, to exclude the urinary tract infection. And then post -void and a bladder diaries is a, uh, uh, the site, the Dr. Pasi said that this is uh, one of the uh, important tools to diagnose uh, people or patients with your lower urinary tract symptom, uh, including the OAB. And then uh, symptom questionnaires, uh, I said that Dr. Paxi, uh, there is a lot of uh, questionnaires in the LATS. Uh, the one of uh, the questionnaires is uh, OAB score then uh, help us to know the severity of uh, OAB in this, uh, this patient. And then test from, uh, it is for complicated or refractory patient that uh, cannot be treated with uh, conservative treatment. The first one is uh, urodynamic and then uh, cytoscopic and we have a diagnosis renal and better ultrasound. So this is not used in the initial work, work up of uncomplicated patient with OAB. The differential, di differential diagnosis uh, for OIB symptom uh, for men is we have a BPH, bladder obstruction, urethral stricture, or uh, some uh, prostate cancer. And women, we have uh, organ uh, prolapse, pelvic organ prolapse, a urethral obstruction, size it is. And both, and men and women, uh, the differential diagnosis is UTI. Diabetes uh, in the diabetes medication or a diuretic uh, medication, post surgical incontinence, and neurogenic bladder, bladder cancer, bladder stone, and stress urinary incontinence. It is the differential diagnosis uh, patient with uh, OAB symptom. The a symptom questionnaire. As I said before, we have uh, overactive bladder symptom score. Uh, there is consists of four question. The first one is how many times do you typically urinate from working in the morning until the sleeping at night? I think this uh, reflect of uh, frequency. And then how many times do you typically wake up to urinate from sleeping at night until working in the morning? This reflect a uh, nocturia. And how often you have a sudden desire to urinate, which is difficult to defer. This is a uh, reflect. Do you lake uh, the urine because you cannot defer the sudden desire to urinate? This is uh, reflect the incontinence. And how about the treatment? So uh, this is uh, the publication in uh, 2001. We see that uh, in the 1,916 patient with overactive bladder, just 60 percent the doctor, and the rest is 40 percent not spoken to the doctor. For the 60 percent spoken to doctor, just 27 percent uh, patient currently on medication and 73 uh, percent patient currently not on medication. Whether this is never tried, this is 73 percent patient and tried but fail is 27 percent patient. 
and from ne uh, never tried to uh, medication likely uh, discuss to doctor again is just uh, 54 percent and not likely to discuss is uh, 46 percent and tried but failed uh, reading and not discussed is 35 percent so in this number this is the european uh, study we said we we know that uh, the overactive bladder is uh, like a mountain of ice so it just see a little but uh, the hole is uh, very big and cannot be treated well how about uh you get line management on female and male urinary incontinence we saw that the first one this is a conservative treatment. Treatment of the comorbidity, advice on bowel condition, and adjustment on medication. And then uh, lifestyle intervention. Uh, we know that we suggest the patient to reduce the caffeine, modification of fluid intake, advice on doing regular physical activity, advice on weight loss, and providing a smoking cessation uh, if the patient had a smoking history. And then uh, the third one is a behavioral and physical therapy offer from fighting for adult with urinary incontinence, offer bladder training as the first line for pelvic floor muscle therapy in the woman, and do not offer electrical stimulation with a surface electrode loan, and do not offer magnetic stimulation for urinary incontinence or OAB in adult women, and consider to do percutaneous stable nerve stimulation as an option for improvement in uh, urgency urinary incontinence in women. And then uh, after the non-medication uh, treatment, the second one is uh, the medication treatment. or uh, beta, tiga, beta 3 agonist, or uh, we, we call it just uh, Mira Begron. This is uh, from Indonesian guideline of urinary incontinence. Uh, we uh, divide into three classification, uh, stress urinary incontinence, mixed urinary incontinence, or urge urinary incontinence. And the first one, uh, this is a lifestyle modification. Uh, Suggest the patient to examine the digestive, uh, the medication, uh, comorbidities, and uh, fluid intake, uh, weight loss, and then uh, use the pen uh, to schedule the voiding if uh, she or he cannot do this. And if the dominant, dominant is uh, Urge urinary incontinence. Uh, the next step is uh, if uh, the patient failed with conservative and drug, we do the some uh, surgery for the OAB. And if the domination is uh, urge urinary incontinence, the uh, choice is antimuscarinic or uh, Mira Begron. And then uh, consider to do percutaneous stable nerve stimulation. And if this uh, drug or this is the treatment is failed, do the surgery for this uh, patient. The drug option for operative bladder, we know that uh, in the bladder muscle, we have uh, two uh, nerve, parasympathetic nerve and sympathetic nerve. And parasympathetic nerve, we have a muscarinic receptor. If we, uh, we do the agonist of a muscarinic receptor, we have a uh, contraction of the bladder and we block if we block the muscarinic receptor we have a uh, uh, lightening of cyclic imp working to the bladder muscle so the end result is relaxation of bladder smooth muscle uh, if the same with a sympathetic nerve we have a uh, beta 3 adrenergic receptor if we uh, use it for uh, agonist we do uh, the longer working of a uh, cyclic AMP, so the result is relaxation. So the drug of choice uh, used the OAB. The first one is uh, M2 or M3 muscarinic receptor antagonist or uh, beta 3 uh, receptor agonist. So stimulation of the beta 3 uh, make the bladder is relaxed and the block of the muscarinic receptor in the bladder make the bladder relax. 
This is the study from Niti and uh, Kular in 2013. Uh, we have uh, compared mirabregon with uh, tolteridin and placebo. Uh, that mirabregon significantly reduced the number of incontinence uh, per 24 hours, and uh, mirabregon significantly reduced the number of micturition uh, per 24 hours uh, if we compare with. And after uh, 12 months of treatment, 63.7 patients have uh, decreased more than 50% uh, incontinence, and then 43.4 uh, patients have a zero incontinence episode. The real world Mirabregon uh, 50 milligram data showed that uh, in the 12 month of use, the Mirabregon said that. Uh, 35, 31.5 uh, patients achieve normalization of frequency, 39% uh, patients achieve normalization of urgency symptom, 68.3% uh, patient have achieved the normalization of of uh, there is no between uh, placebo, mirabregron, and uh, tolteridine to the side effect, and then we saw that the, uh, the effect uh, dry mode is uh, lower uh, in the mirabregron if we compare with uh, tolteridine. The side effect make uh, almost all patients stop uh, or discontinue the medication for OAB. We saw that uh, is uh, three times lower if we compare with tolteridine. This is the belief study. This is uh, comparing the quality of life treatment satisfactory and persistent in a patient with OAB. There is a multi center, non interventional year uh, 12 month study to assess the quality of life a patient with OAB. This is uh, published in the 2018. So, that this primary endpoint is. Uh, Quality of life, of course, is the patient after two or five months, uh, the Mirabregon, and then comparing with uh, after 12 months of Mirabregon, said that improvement of uh, OAB uh, from uh, two until four months of treatment, uh, if, we, if we compare with uh, after 10 or 12 months uh, medication of Mirabregon. So the patient receiving Mirabregon in the real world setting reported meaningful improvement in quality of life and health status. So the summary for this uh, topic, OIB is a condition which uh, the bladder or the digital muscle becomes uh, very active. The symptom doesn't uh, cause death, but it will impact the patient daily activity and quality of life of the patient. The pharmacotherapy option uh, used to treat are antimuscarinic and uh, beta 3 agonist or mirabegron and mirabegron studies support the efficacy persistency tolerability and co uh, and improvement in quality of life in uh, patient with oab thank you thank you very much dr Tafik, for your nice presentation and for our next speaker i will be our guest speaker dr jose benito abraham he will deliver urinary stone management during the COVID pandemic era. Dr. Joben, a urologist, a urologist and kidney transplant surgeon from National Kidney and Transplant Institute, Philippines, also a chief section of minimally invasive urology from St. Luke Medical Center in Quezon City, Manila also had a quality management team uh, from Center from, uh, for Organ Transplantation St. Luke Medical Center in Global City, Manila. As a, a, uh, he also clinical fellowship in kidney transplantation and immunology from University of Texas at Science Center, Houston, Texas, USA. Dr. Joe Ben, time is yours.
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you for that kind introduction, uh, Dr. Darianto. Before anything else, <clears throat> I'd like to greet and thank the organizers of the Malang Continuing Neurological Education and all our Indonesian colleagues and friends, especially Dr. Paxi for this kind invitation. I recall how prior to the pandemic, we had originally planned for me to visit Malang to speak about PCNL and transplantation. <clears throat> However, like all other meetings, it was canceled because of the pandemic. So therefore, I'd like you to know that I'm very pleased and very happy and privileged that we are now gathered together in this MCUE webinar series. <clears throat> Not playing. Once again. Uh, the slide is not changing. Once again. Okay. So for this for this talk, I have no uh, conflicts of interest. Allow me to introduce you to the National Kidney and Transplant Institute, or the NKTI where I had my residency training in urology and where I currently practice. It is a government specialty center <clears throat> attached to the Department of Health with mandates on uh, uh, can, you, can you unhost me so that uh, the waiting room doesn't come up here? Committee, can you just uh, help Dr. Joben not becoming a co-host? So, uh, I think the the, the, the pop up in his screen. No, it's okay. Okay, go now. You go. You go, Joben. The slide won't change. One second. You you should you could uh, you could click in the in the screen or maybe at the lower left side of your PowerPoint. It's not moving, one second. Can you, can you unshare for one second? You can unshare. Oh, okay. Uh, nothing's happening from my end. Okay, wait one second, one second. <clears throat> Are we, can you see the slide now? <clears throat> Not yet. One second, I apologize. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay, once again, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> the National Kidney and Transplant Institute or the NKTI. I had my residency here and I also practice here currently. It is a government uh, center attached to the Department of Health with mandates on the prevention, diagnosis, rehabilitation, and treatment of kidney and allied diseases through expert care in nephrology, urology, and transplantation. So NKTI is also the seat of endourology training and practice in the Philippines, where the first clinical fellowship in minimally invasive urology in the country was started only this year. This is the outline of my talk. We shall discuss how the coronavirus continues to be a persistent health concern, then look back briefly on how the pandemic has affected all of us acutely. We shall then talk about the strategies and preparations we had made during the transition period, and finally summarize lessons learned in the practice of the new normal. I will be presenting institutional experience and data in the course of the discussion. <clears throat> After that, I encourage a healthy interchange of ideas at the end of the talk so that we may learn from each other's experiences. 
This is the WHO COVID-19 dashboard showing us the number of cases in the Philippines, which is now close to 200,000. Not too far behind is Indonesia, which we had overtaken some few weeks ago. So the Philippines is now considered the leading hotspot of coronavirus in Southeast Asia, something that we cannot be truly proud of. This slide shows us how we have done since the first case was reported in March. Since then, despite the quarantine measures, the number of reported cases continued to rise. And evidently, we are still far from flattening the curve. Let us look a little bit on how this has affected the NKTI. We all know that the COVID-19 pandemic is a national concern and all hospitals have the duty to rise up to the demands of the crisis. <clears throat> In the beginning, the NKTI confronted a unique challenge because we were a dedicated transplant center. And given the risk the pandemic may impose on our immunocompromised transplant recipients, we wanted to keep our hospital COVID free and initially planned on refusing COVID-19 patients. However, in as much as we wanted to, being one of the Department of Health's flagship hospital, we had to participate in providing service to patients with COVID. We also saw that some of the most vulnerable patients were those with chronic kidney disease. Therefore, it was not possible to avoid potential COVID patients from this patient population. So moving ahead, let us look at the immediate and long-term impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the delivery of surgical services. So as you can see here, during the initial influx of pandemic cases, all elective surgeries had to be postponed, a phenomenon that occurred worldwide. Because of the overwhelming uh, number of cases that came in, the acute phase is characterized by a high number of pandemic deaths. The high influx of patients with COVID infection also limited the access to healthcare of patients with non-pandemic diseases, posing also a high risk of non-pandemic deaths from the lack of surgical services in ICU. While the healthcare system applies intensive uh, suppression and mitigation strategies to control the pandemic, the ability to offer life-saving procedures such as those referring to cancer and transplantation may also not be sustained leading to additional loss of lives unrelated to the pandemic. This is compounded even further by the patient's fear of coming to the hospital, causing further delay in consults, which can lead to the risk of worsening disease or loss of organ or even death. At the tail end, with the gradual flattening of the curve, elective surgery needs to be gradually resumed in order to minimize the risk of more non-pandemic deaths. It is at this point when the long-term effects of cancellation or delays are now felt by the patient. For example, you can have a patient with worsening degree of hydronephrosis, infection, urosepsis, or even renal failure. During the recovery phase, the gradual resumption of elective surgery needs to happen. <clears throat> Some difficulties may arise because the term elective is vague and open to interpretation. As a result, the urologists will have to make their difficult decisions about which procedures should resume and continue under the current circumstances. This will be a problem that each of us should resolve every time we encounter a patient. On top of that, the longer the delay, the more glaring backlog becomes. And therefore, we need to plan on how we can initiate treatment on these patients one at a time. The important thing to understand is that while all of these are happening and we are struggling to overcome the pandemic, there should be training of personnel in every phase. Our webinar is a clear example of this. By attending meetings, we begin to understand the behavior of the coronavirus and the pandemic. At the same time, we learn strategies and processes that are needed to overcome them. Clear and constant communication among ourselves is therefore the key to moving ahead. One of the critical points in is keeping our health workers healthy. It is extremely important to ensure that surgeons with specialized skills 
should remain functional throughout the pandemic. As they take care of their patients, we cannot allow them to get sick <clears throat> because that will mean the collapse of the healthcare industry. For example, the senior surgeons who have gained the most astute technical skill and are also the most efficient administratively are usually responsible for mentoring the young surgeons. They typically provide the highest level of care to patients and therefore losing them during the pandemic will also mean the need to recruit younger surgeons into the fray who likely have less experience and minimal administrative abilities. So a few minutes ago, we heard that one of the urologists in Indonesia expired. So that is a tragedy for the healthcare industry in Indonesia. We can also never underestimate the valuable contribution of our partners in healthcare, including the nursing staff <clears throat> and all the supporting departments. A conscious effort should be made to minimize infection in this sector. A high mortality rate within this group would be detrimental to the system. It is critical, therefore, that we minimize the risk of COVID infection within the hospital setting. And for this, engineering and administrative controls form the foundation of prevention. These refer to policies and structural changes within the hospital that affect clinical practice in the traffic personnel, patient triage, cohorting, admission, and prioritization. <clears throat> this also includes segregation of COVID and non-COVID cases to designated areas and assigning them exclusive OR suites. Recently, the Philippine College of Surgeons released a document entitled Recommendations for the Rational and Effective Use of PPE. <clears throat> we certainly cannot underestimate its importance in protecting ourselves. Having PPE gives us a certain level of confidence in conducting ourselves. All the members of the surgical team, anesthesia and nursing staff should be knowledgeable in their types and uses. These are some of the practical ways by which we conserve the PPE, such as use of telemedicine to limit visits to the hospital facilities, <clears throat> use of physical barriers in areas of the hospital, zoning of COVID and non-COVID areas, audits by safety officers, and commitment of all healthcare workers to use PPE judiciously by applying conservation strategies. This slide shows you how to don and doff the PPE. We all need to be educated and trained in this, knowing that one of the most common causes of COVID infection occurs when we do not doff our PPE properly. So again, looking back when the pandemic set in, the entire, the entire healthcare industry was in shock. People were unprepared to handle the crisis. Urological communities were not exempt from this. There was no exact formula on how to respond to it given our patients' needs. The first group to come up with guidelines was a panel of Italian urologists who agreed on the reorganization of urological practice and a set of recommendations that should facilitate the process of rescheduling both surgical and outpatient activities during the COVID-19 pandemic. From the point of view of urinary stone disease, the following principles were applied. Urinary stone disease are deferrable, and urinary diversion is preferred, such as the use of PCN in ureteral stenting. <clears throat> Strict indications for acute intervention include sepsis, compromised renal function, and uh, renal failure. A little later, the EAU guidelines office rapid response group <clears throat> created a more detailed recommendation on several urological conditions. The collaborative effort of the EAU categorized the patients based on the severity of their disease and the potential effect it may have on renal function and patient survival. So in relation to stone disease, low priority are small stones with no obstruction and are asymptomatic. Intermediate priority are stones more than 2CM with mild symptoms and obstruction. <clears throat> High priority are symptomatic stones and crusted stents and those with severe obstruction while emergency are patients with urosepsis, conditions with threatened renal function, such as those with bilateral obstruction, solitary kidneys, and those occurring in pregnancy. The preferred therapy is still either stenting or nephrostomy tube insertions, which are meant to temporize the case for a future stage procedure. 
Another guideline on urinary stone therapy came from the University of Washington. They share certain similarities to the EAU in terms of timing and indications for intervention. Comorbidities are also mentioned. The main difference here is that for the first time, stone treatment is mentioned explicitly as preferred over drainage, unless active infection or stage treatment is expected. Ureteroscopy was also highlighted to be preferred over a shockwave because of higher stone free rates and lower rate of secondary stone procedures. Stentless or stent on string was suggested to avoid frequent clinic visits. In the guideline, however, we will note that they recommended postponement of PCNL treatment. They even stated that it should be done on rare occasions where there is recurrent infection, anti-related issues and renal compromise. A set of recommendations also came from the Urolithiasis Committee of the French Urology Association. In this document, stone diseases were categorized to deferable or emergency, but among the treatment options mentioned, the drainage was still the preferred option, as you can see here. After an extensive search of literature, I finally found an article where the words endourology stone management and COVID were all mentioned in the same title. I was very excited when I found this because I anticipated about reading guidelines during the COVID on ureteroscopy, RIRS and PCNL. So here they describe an elegant algorithm in the triaging of patient based on the emergent nature or the likelihood of having COVID infection. In this diagram, we see prioritization scheme for stone patients scheduled for surgery during the COVID-19 pandemic. It laid down very similar criteria reminiscent of the AU guidelines. However, once again, as I was approaching the end of the document, recommendations were limited to stent placement, which was considered superior to nephrostomy tube because the latter could be inadvertently pulled out. There were other documents a lot of them that were published discussing the impact of COVID-19 to the practice of urology, but none of them were focused particularly on urinary stone management. The most common areas of discussion pertain to malignancies and other urological conditions. Considering all the lessons learned from these guidelines, we decided to formulate our own in order to plan for a safe and gradual resumption of end urology practice. We anchored our guidelines on the twofold principles laid, laid down by the Philippine College of Surgeons. The first was COVID awareness, which includes knowledge of local and national data, as well as government and hospital guidelines on clinical practices. In this document, a sustained reduction in the number of reported cases for at least 14 days was the requirement. This was very challenging considering that Manila had the most number of COVID cases. The second principle, however, is institutional preparedness, which refers to the following requirements. Testing capabilities with RT-PCR available hospital and manpower resources, PPE availability and local facility capacity. So in spite of the persistent COVID problem, we had to act accordingly for the following reasons. Number one, we were a large volume referral center for stones. Any delay in management will translate to an endless list of backlogs. We, however, knew that in order to proceed safely, we had to have all of these requirements in place, such as engineering and administrative controls, expert personnel and manpower, facility capacity and capability, and guidelines for the resumption of surgical practices. One of the instruments that really helped us is the gene expert express of SARS-CoV-2. This is a fast turnaround time and results are typically released within the day. Combining this with either a chest X-ray or a chest CT, we can now stratify our patients in a timely manner prior to their admission. Why is that important? The impact of COVID infection to the post-operative outcomes of patients were analyzed in this international cohort study involving over 1,100 patients in 24 countries. 
Results show that the 30-day mortality for COVID positive patients 50 years or older is at least 20%. The pulmonary complication rates among COVID positive patients are extremely high and are at least 40 to 50%. And surprisingly, COVID positive patients undergoing urological procedures have a 32.4% mortality and up to almost 60% pulmonary complication rates. <clears throat> so lesson learned from this is that we should avoid operating on COVID positive patients. This is the men's scoring system published by the American College of Surgeons. It incorporates procedure factors, disease, and patient characteristics to the decision process of proceeding with surgery. <clears throat> Table one pertains to the complexity of the OR procedure. <clears throat> Several factors such as OR time, estimated length of stay, the need for post-operative ICU care, anticipated blood loss, the size of the surgical team, the likelihood of intubation and surgical site are all considered. So for example, <clears throat> if you were to do a PCNL that is anticipated to last for about an hour, that's a score of two with an estimated length of stay of about two to three days. So that would be a score of three. Post-operative -ICU, ICU care, unlikely, that's one. Anticipated blood loss, again, minimal, that's one. Surgical team, maybe two. Uh, one consultant, one assist. Likely intubation is uh, maybe for supine PCNL, that's one, but for prone, that would be uh, one to five. <clears throat> but minimally, minimally invasive surgery, that would be two because uh, PCNL is a minimally invasive procedure. So this table is a little more difficult to understand, but simply put, it pertains to whether non-operative means are available and the impact of delay to enter to either the disease outcome or the surgical difficulty or risk. So again, for example, if you have a ureteral stone, which is unlikely to pass with medical expulsive therapy, then you give a score of one. If delay of about two to six weeks will make the patient worse as well, then you uh, apply the corresponding score. <clears throat> Uh, based on the table. So this last table is pretty straightforward. So it takes into account the patient characteristics and comorbid, comorbid conditions and the likelihood of having COVID. So again, these are factored in accordingly. So once a score is reached, this is compared to a spectrum <clears throat> where an area on the left is allocated to allowable procedures. A score in the middle is reserved for emergent and urgent cases while area to the right is for non-justifiable procedures. These scores may be adjusted based on the institution's capability and uh, personal assessment. <clears throat> so when difficult decisions have to be made on whether a procedure is allowable or not, we try to look at the men's score and apply it accordingly to help us in the decision-making. Telemedicine is important because it limits the hospital visits of patients. It facilitates the preoperative evaluation, which includes a comprehensive history taking followed by recommendations on a complete biochemical profile and radiographic imaging. So the same telemedicine consult can be applied on follow-up on the preoperative risk stratification and accomplishment of preoperative requirements. So this is our admission flow chart. <clears throat> it all starts with a clinical indication for surgery, followed by risk stratification vis-a-vis -vis testing for COVID infection. Once this is completed, we can now proceed with scheduling of the patient at OR. <clears throat> After a thorough urological evaluation has been completed together with the surgical plan, the patient fills up two forms, the preoperative surgical checklist and the COVID screening checklist. They do a swab and a chest x-ray on the day of admission. And once these are negative, they can then be admitted. They also fill up a health declaration form, which is uh, applied to both the patient and the companion of the patient. So this includes the, also uh, data on renal diagnosis, whether a patient is, has chronic kidney disease, as well as uh, exposure history to potential uh, COVID patients. 
So this table summarizes the cases of patients we had performed undergoing shockwave during the pandemic. So these are the patients and stone demographics. As you can see, there were no retreatment procedures and no complications. All of them were done as outpatient procedures. This table summarizes the case of endoscopic laser lithotripsy, which we did for ureter and bladder stones. So we did a total of uh, 17 ureteroscopic lithotripsy and six uh, cystoscopic uh, lithotripsy. So among the the sites, you have a proximal eight, middle three, distal five, and one allograft distal ureter. <clears throat> the mean size is 0.6 to 1.5. For the bladder stones, uh, three were done. Uh, I think two were done in conjunction with uh, TRP, and three were done in uh, for uh, forgotten encrusted stents. The mean size for this is 1.9 with a range of 1.2 to 3.5. <clears throat> So the stone free rate was 92%, complications were none. The length of stay was 1.5. So for the exciting part, this summarizes the number of TCN cases we have done. Uh, we have a modest number. These are the patient and stone demographics. We did nine bilateral uh, synchronous PCNLs and eight unilateral PCNLs for a total of 25 renal units. <clears throat> Five were done on the left, three were done on the right. The mean size was 3.6 uh, with a range of 0.9 to 6.9 centimeters. We did uh, one supine PCNL and 16 prone. 12 were done with a single track, four uh, multi-track. Stone free rate was 93.75%. Complication rate was grade one infection in one and grade two transfusion in another. Just wanted to share with you that uh, supine PCNL that we did, <clears throat> this was simultaneous with the uteroscopic laser trips on the left. So if you look at the CT, there's a pelvolithiasis on the, on the right with uh, some multiple uh, lower pole calculi that are not seen on this image. And then you have a distal third ureteric stone. So you can see here the pillows uh, donated by Dr. Paxi to us. We continue to use them, patient on the BARTs, uh, flank preposition with the landmarks placed. So you can see one resident doing ureteroscopic lithotripsy while another resident was uh, doing the puncture for supine PCNL. So these are the images for that. The patient was rendered uh, stone free. Uh, the OR time for that was under two hours and there were no complications. I'd like to share with you this very complex uh, kidney stone on a 28 year old female who had undergone bilateral preliminary uh, stenting pre-COVID lockdown. So he, she had a right staghorn on the, see a scene on CT and left pulvolithiasis. So we did a synchronous multi-track uh, right PCNL with a left uh, upper pole prone uh, PCNL. Again, patient was rendered stone free with no complications. So I'd like to share again th this uh, interesting case, 38 year old female with bilateral flank pain and fever. She underwent a left nephrectomy early in the pandemic for biohydronephrosis and renal abscess extending to the spleen and was now here for interval right PCNL. So at that point, the diagnosis was solitary right kidney with double collecting system and staghorn in both moieties. So the procedure done was multi-track prone PCNL <clears throat> These are the intraoperative outcomes. Operative time, 120 minutes, estimated blood loss under one liter and stone tree. And then there's this uh, very large uh, staghorn on a 54 year old female with left lung pain and recurrent UTI. So again, we did a multi-track standard prone PCNL which rendered the patient stone free. And then there's this case I'd like to share with you, a very interesting 67 year old hypertensive with liver cirrhosis, not in failure with gallstones, with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. He had a uh, right pelvolithiasis, <clears throat> but at the same time he had an enhancing renal mass on the lower pole on the right, which is suspicious for malignancy. So therefore I did a single upper pole standard tubeless prone PCNL 
and he recovered well without any complications. He is for interval percutaneous needle RFA or microwave therapy to which he had already agreed. Uh, but we were not limited to endurological procedures during the COVID pandemic. So we tried to balance for the sake of our residents, uh, a good number of uh, open surgery. So as you can see here, we did a total of 10, uh, mostly these were uh, kidney stones. So we did a couple of extended pyelonephrolithotomy, one anatrophic, uh, one pyelolithotomy, and two uh, pyelonephrolithotomy. We also did the TRP with systolithotomy in two, and we did the proximal urethrolithotomy in two. So these were the post-operative outcomes. The mean stone size was 3.7 with a range of two to eight. Mean operative time is 127 minutes. Mean blood loss is 875. The stone free rate was high at 90%. Complication rate was 30. These are all transfusion in three out of 10 patients. The length of hospital stay was 3.5. Uh, there was no mortality in this series. So apart from that, we of course, uh, post-operatively assured that our patients remain healthy. Uh, so we asked them to stay vigilant and do practice habitual hand washing, wearing of masks and avoiding unnecessary congregation and physical distancing when they go home. And then continue their consults with telemedicine. So in spite of our apparent success and our modest experience, we continue to be challenged. You may have seen this recently where the NKTI and the St. Luke's declared full capacity for COVID-19 cases. However, we believe we cannot be stifled in our need to serve our patients with urinary stone disease. After all, they also deserve treatment too. So lessons learned, uh, symptomatic and obstructive urinary stone disease pose a threat to renal function, patient health, and survival. During this pandemic, it is possible to treat these patients with definitive stone management without resorting to preliminary drainage or diversion, which may delay treatment unnecessarily. A meticulous preoperative preparation inclusive of COVID screening and standard risk stratification are needed to avoid complications. Institutional preparedness and collaboration is key to, to success. However, we also admit that the COVID-19 pandemic still takes precedence. And when an imbalance is reached, the COVID takes a priority. So I'd like to end with this slide so we cannot over emphasize the key points in prevention of spread, which is the use of mask, hand washing, and social distancing. And I would like to quote the president of the Philippine College of Surgeons that although we may feel that we are slowly overcoming this disease, we should be vigilant and not complacent in protecting ourselves and our families as we resume and continue to deliver the services that our patients need. That would be all. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Joven, for your nice presentation. It's very clear, and very completely. Okay, for the last speaker, uh, our last speaker, Dr. Eka Yuda Rahman, uh, presented about uh, managing non-traumatic urology emergency in pandemic era. Dr. Eka Yuda is a urologist from Lambung Mangkurat uh, Faculty of Medicine. Uh, Ulin Hospital so, uh, Banjarmasin, South Kalimantan. Dr. Eka Yuda, time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Besu, for nice uh, introduction. Uh, I will present it how to manage non-traumatic urology emergency in the pandemic era. Okay, next. Next. Okay. Uh, number of urogenital disorder occurring apart from trauma and whose management cannot be delayed. Uh, management should be quick. And let case in death and or functional prognosis organ is present. For example, the torsio testis and uh, priapismus is the functional equation. Uh, case non-traumatic emergency is uh, renal colic, uh, cutinary retention, 
postcrotal pain, torsio testis, priapism, tunia gangrene, and urea and hematuria. Next. Okay, prevalency, urinary complete retention is the percentage, high percentage, number one. And immature acute renal colic is second and third for non traumatic emergency urology. Next. Uh, the management urinary complete retention with first is urethral catheterization uh, with double catheter. If we can uh, inserting the DC or double catheter, we must do cysto catheterization or cystostomy. Uh, acute renal colic, uh, we can give medical therapy. Uh, the excretory anury, we must do nephrostomy or percutaneous nephrostomy. If uh, at some case, uh, obstetric gynecology we can do a hysterectomy, can ligation ureter. We, we must do the ureter implantation and ureteral catheterization. Hematuria, we do a ureteral catheterization and with bladder wash irrigation with uh, NS normal saline. And spermatic cord torsion, we must do untwisting or torsi and bilateral orchidopexy. Acute orchitis, we do suspensory bandage and medical therapy. And stasis, papism, we do spong carbon deviation according to intersection procedure. If uh, we fail, uh, medication therapy. And last, for near gangrene, we do debridema, necrosectomy, antibiotic therapy, retal catheterization, and reanimation or reconstruction. Next. Okay, and pandemic era, we know about COVID-19 and from Wuhan, China, emerging attack and management strategy. Okay, next. Right. First in China and Indonesia in two March, uh, President Joko Widodo announced the first to confirm case of the disease in the country. Next. Uh, Indonesia in update in 22 August as 149 thousand confirmed uh, positive of COVID-19. In my home in Banjarmasin, South Borneo is a red zone, yeah? like in Jakarta, Surabaya, Makassar, and Sumatra uh, uh, Medan. Okay, next. Uh, health worker like us are the at the forefront of the COVID-19 outbreak response and as such as exposed to hazard that put them at risk and of infection. In the world, uh, 1,413 report dead. In Indonesia, uh, 86 doctor reported dead in August 21st. We must uh, persona protective equipment. Okay, next. Non traumatic urology emergency in the pandemic area. Uh, the guideline, AAU guideline, the guideline office commissioned a rapid traction group, produced a color code risk a certification tool for completion by guideline panel. Uh, low priority uh, green, intermediate priority yellow, high priority red, and 
plaque for emergency for low priority clinical harm very unlikely be postponed for six months and intermediate priority clinical harm possible if postponed for three or four months but unlikely and high priority clinical harm very likely postponed for uh, six weeks and emergency is life threatening situation next Uh, it is a criteria for prioritization and procedure and on pandemic. Okay, next. Uh, renal colic, uh, acute blank pain is, we will be uh, keep and relief. So, WHO was recommended to open avoid uh, application ibuprofen when possible. Metamizol seem to be a good, a good alternative in acute renal colic. Uh, renal decompression in case analgetic preparatory colic pain or treating oral sepsis or emergency procedure and so be performed as soon as the local situation allow. Next. Acute urinary retention in in willing urine catheter placement or percutaneous cystotomy with local anesthesia are indicated for preservation of renal function. I recommend postpone definitive operation. Uh, for example, the cause of acute renal retention is BH, the most cause of urinary retention. Uh, process surgery for BPS shall be considered a non-emergency. Next, acute scrotal pain, uh, torsio testis is the uh, emergency in urology. Surgically intervene immediately. We can explore and uh, untwisting out of the torsi, the affected testicle, and if this is feasible. We do bilateral orchidopexy, orchidopexy, and if failing, uh, orchidectomy of the affected gonad. Next. Uh, uh, Periapismus, periapism, maybe of is emergency. Uh, low flow periapism, it should not be delayed. It, the functional can be uh, important at all our dysfunction erect, dysfunction erection if we delay uh, management of therapism. The stiff ischemic therapism emergency. Okay, next. Funi gangren. Uh, surgical debridement necrosectomy and intravenous derivative treatment. Uh, the performance of uh, surgery, surgery by experienced urologist. Procedure should be performed with the minimum number of staff mem members. Alternative uh, therapy is hyperbaric uh, room, hyperbaric oxygen for chronic gangrene. And anuria, uh, sepsis due to obstructing stone, obstructing stone and anuria is a gender compensation this collecting system, percutaneous uh, nephrostomy or stem. Okay, next. And hematuria. Uh, Blood clot retention is must uh, evacuation. Uh, we uh, must find cause must be identified. Oral catheter should be placed and the bladder should be irrigated with normal saline. If hematuria persists, uh, endoscopic examination should be performed. Cystoscopy, fulguration uh, and active site of bleeding, and eventually perform uh, transuretral resectomy of bladder tumor or prostate tumor. 
I'm trying to minimize, minimize the hospital stay. Next. This uh, flowchart or algorithm recommendation for emergency operating. Patient to come to ER and analysis early detection of COVID-19. Patient to suspect COVID-19. GPS, we do rapid test or uh, RT-PCR. Positive COVID-19 operation with PPE level three. If negative, COVID-19 operation with general precaution PPE. Okay, next. This is a personal protective equipment in ER, what an operating room. In PSA, we do surgical mask with minimum distance one meter. Patient confirm COVID-19 with a gown, glove, surgical mask, or mask and uh, N95, surgical cup, Google with facial protective shoes. And patient will confirm COVID-19 and receive aerosol generating procedure like tracheal intubation, tracheostomy, and passive ventilation, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, carbonoscopy, nebulation, and swap packing. Uh, gown, BPI with gown, globe, upfront, and 90 five masks, surgical cup, Google with facial and protective shoes. Next. Preparation in operating room, donning PPI with or without PAPR, power air proofing respirator. Prepare the operating room and position the patients, operator scrubbing. Intraoperative, we do operation as effectively as possible. And postoperative, uh, remove PPI and VAVR and enter room, uh, surgical gown, glove cap, and sucapel. And outside, enter room, and 95, Google and VAVR. Put your cap and glove in the outside of the enter room. And follow up. Put the PFR on the container for disinfection and charge PFR. Next, proper care personal protective equipment. Adequate personal adequate personal protective equipment in operating room and necessary for ensuring the health of individual healthcare provider, maintaining an adequate workforce during the pandemic. Uh, gown, glove, mask, and eye protection. Mm. CDC recommend using an nine N95 respirator mask during procedure that have the potential to realize the virus. But still, along with the 95 mask to prevent droplet from accumulating. Next. Recommending preoperative testing. Uh, to determine with patients are at highest risk for transmission. As N95 masks are recommended for the surgical staff if aerosol generating procedure on the respiratory tract are being performed. Next. Workflow. The workflow in the operating room has changed and will evolve this as the pandemic continues. Entering and exiting the room should be kept to a minimum. Minimizing personal and traffic into and out of the operating room. And recommended having the few necessary step present during intubation on or aerosolizing procedure, especially if the intubation can be done in a negative pressure room. Next. Uh, take home message. There are some original emergency cases besides uh, trauma that cannot be delayed for immediate treatment. Acute urinary tension is the most often non trauma rugby emergency case. A guideline, the yeah, AU guideline, uh, produced a uh, color code risk traffic patient pool, green uh, for low priority, orange intermediate priority, and red. Security and black emergency uh, situation. 
in order to minimize the number of staff that become infected all medical personnel should be comply with the personal protection equipment regulation social distancing is the key player to fight against COVID-19 pandemic we have a duty to avoid and unnecessary oppression visit us and it's doing so this this chain of virus transmission okay next Thank you for attention, Dr. Besut. Thank you, Dok. Okay, thank you, Dr. Eka Yuda, for your nice presentation. Now, time for discussion for the information. Until now, this webinar followed by uh, more than 500 live webinar and 42 from YouTube, and for the uh, participant, 40. Uh, 48 participation from foreign uh, participant from Philippines, India, and uh, Kazakhstan. Now, uh, uh, time for discussion. The first question from Dr. Eric Utahurit. Uh, the question to Dr. Paxi. Most of the prostate patient comes with LATS and sexual dysfunction. How to manage both of them, Dr. Paxi? Yes, thank you very much. There are three questions actually already uh, uh, come into the committee. The first question was from Dr. Eric Tahoruk, and this is a very common question coming from our uh, general practitioner, and also urologists, and also common problems. Uh, this is what I said that um, treatment for uh, benign prostatic enlargement or benign prostatic hyperplasia should be individualized because uh, one of the aspects of the man's health is uh, sexual uh, function. And there are many patients with uh, PPH comes also with uh, erectile dysfunction symptoms. So. There are one option that could be a, a PDA5 inhibitor, a Tadalafil with a low dose and continuous. So it has a significant uh, uh, impact for the sexual function. The problem with this, uh, with this uh, treatment is, is the cost because the uh, five milligram Saldalafil is basically more expensive compared to uh, to the alpha blockers treatment, that is the that is the problem. So the first answer would be the PDE five inhibitors, and uh, Dr. Busut. Yeah, for the okay. second question, sorry, so, uh, from the doctor Queen Mercy, maybe from okay. Philippine. Queen Mercy, yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, another another example that uh, BPH treatment should be very personalized as yes. uh, urgency uh, dominantly or uh, nocturia. It means the storage symptoms is uh, more uh, more significant compared to the uh, avoiding symptoms. Then we could consider to give antimuscarinic and with that we organize definitely. So I have some patient also with uh, uh, with the uh, symptoms more dominant uh, blockers and also antimuscarinic. We should also uh, it's rarely to give uh, three drugs. I don't I don't normally give three drugs. For example, alpha blockers and then um, uh, five alpha replace inhibitor and also antimuscarinic. Uh, we just have to evaluate whether the patient have predominantly storage or uh, avoiding symptoms. So I would only give alpha blockers and uh, antimuscarinic or beta three agonists. It's also uh, have a good uh, significant impact for the patients. And the last one, um, if the patient have a uh, side effect of the uh, the stasaride therapy, uh, can we reduce the the dosage? So. This is the, the, the condition in, in my own practice. If a patient uh, has a, uh, a serious side effect of the medication, I don't 
uh, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to lower the, the frequency. I'm not going to lower the dosage because I don't have inhibitory uh, uh, therapy impact. So I will start the, uh, the, the dostoseride. And then uh, I will only go with the alpha blockers. So because the, 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 the first choice to treat um, LUTs in a bladder outlet obstruction caused by the BPH is not, five, is not to give five alpha reductase inhibitor. The first choice would be alpha first. Then if we consider to give a, a, a five alpha reductase inhibitor depends on the size of the prostate and depends of the, what is the propose of giving the testosterone? Because testosterone uh, or, or 5 alpha phase inhibitor has the propose to lower the risk of clinical progression. So, but the, if the patient could not tolerate the drugs, then we should stop it, give one medication, and if the patient did not tolerate or, or the therapy is not, uh, significantly uh, reduced the complaints, then we have to think about do surgery. So it's not about uh, uh, lowering the dose. Uh, from the patients who uh, stopped uh, taking uh, the stasaride, a significant number of complaints arise after one year of cessation. So uh, if, if we want to give a stasaride, we have to understand that we will give this a long-term a therapy, it could be one year, two year, or even, so if the patient could not tolerate, don't give it, use alpha blockers, and if the, if the uh, symptoms still uh, uh, progress, then you have to think oh, yes. about doing, uh, you oh, have to I'm think about do surgery for the patients. I think uh, that's my, uh, that is my answer, Dr. Besut, maybe, Doctor, uh, other other uh, faculty have any other uh, opinion? Maybe Doctor Joban or Doctor Tofik or Doctor Eka. So that's my answer. Doctor, is it? Uh, uh, no, so question for the doctor. Uh, any any comment for the doctor Vaxi? Uh, just comment for the second question from the okay. uh, audience. That, uh, the treatment so not all uh, patients uh, be combined combine with random clinic or beta tree so we just uh, we must evaluate we must evaluate the first uh, slide the symptom the symptom the and the second one is euro three, and then the post fight residual. If the if we have uh, much more uh, residual void after the uh, after the patient void, uh, we not uh, we just not uh, combine with antimuscarinic because the complication is uh, urinary retention. So if the well, is more than 50 cc, is not recommended to uh, combination with uh, antimuscarinic or which is three agonists. Maybe this other uh, side. Okay, thank you. Now we have uh, two questions for Dr. Taufik. Uh, first question from the Dr. Soraya Ulfa. How long are we supposed to conduct conservative lifestyle and behavior intervention before we consider it fail? Or we just simply with stimulation uh, simultaneously with the drug intervention? And secondly, for uh, Dr. Ahmad, or the type of OAB is acid the approach to the treatment with or dry OAB patient, Dr. Tofik, please. Okay. Uh, for the first question, I think OAB treatment, the first one is the lifestyle modification and the physical treatment. So uh, we must follow the, uh, the guideline or the uh, the uh, uh, I mean, the, the guidelines said that the first one you must say the, there is 
lifestyle modifications such as uh, you lose your body weight and maintain the uh, fluid intake and so on and so on. And after that, if uh, we got a three or uh, six months evaluation and the uh, conservative treatment is failed, and then we go to the second choice with uh, drugs. Uh, we use uh, antimuscarinic or beta-3 agonies, and then we just evaluate again for three or six months if uh, the condition is getting better. Uh, we just continue the drug. If uh, the patient had a more more uh, severe symptom, uh, so we do the proper uh, the proper uh, diagnosis. Uh, for the there is uh, the, the difference between wet or dry OAB. Uh, as long as I know that uh, there is no difference, we treat the patient with uh, wet or dry OAB. The recommendation said that the first uh, thing we do the lifestyle modification and then the physical treatment, and if we, if we fail with this uh, condition. We uh, begin with the uh, drug and uh, we evaluate it after uh, we give him the drug. If uh, the symptom still consists, we consider, consider it to the uh, invasive uh, treatment for this patient. Comment from another speaker. Uh, any experience from another speaker for this question? And how long we get, uh, maybe some patient or uh, some uh, general practi practitioner uh, will be asked uh, how long we give the drug. Uh, medication and how long we, we get the drug. I see that uh, we know that for um, pharmacologic uh, pharmacologic uh, science that if we if we uh, if we give uh, the uh, antagonist for the long time, there is super sensitization for the uh, receptor. So the dose the dose is uh, must be increasing after time. And if we give a uh, long time. We do the receptor will be uh, down sensitive, uh, down regulation. So uh, we must uh, decrease the dose. So this is uh, back again to the concept that uh, the treatment of uh, OEB or LATS is so individually. This the dose even uh, we can. Uh, alternate the medication for two two days uh two days uh one dose and uh, something like that because if uh, we continue for the long time there is uh super sensitization or down regulation of the receptor in the bladder muscle so the drug will be not effectively Maybe. okay Maybe any comment for the other speaker? I just want to emphasize something, Dr. Basut. When we find patients with a, a predominantly storage symptoms, we really, really should uh, uh, exclude other, other, uh, other abnormality. For example, uh, in men, we have to exclude whether it is uh, a BPH predominantly uh, with, uh, with uh, 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 storage symptoms. Or in, in many cases, in female, in female, in woman patients, we have to really exclude uh, other diagnoses who cause the lower urinary tract symptoms. Before we come into the overactive bladder diagnosis, we really have to conduct uh, urinalysis, urine culture, you have to exclude, is there any foreign bodies in the bladder? 
uh, what about the hormonal condition? It's because uh, the frequency or urgency or nocturia it could be caused by many things. Then if all of the things are excluded, then we have to think about also uh, when patients come with uh, uh, LUTs or, or, um, or uh, frequency, um, most of the patient who comes to me has already given antibiotics. So that is another different, different thing. When you have patients with uh, low urinary symptoms, uh, please evaluate everything before start doing uh, medication. Is it a true infection or is it not infection? Because it because uh, giving the wrong medication could lead to a more severe problem. That's my comment. Thank you, Dr. Taufik, for your answer and comment for the Dr. Pasi. No question for uh, from the participant to uh, Dr. Joben. We have a question from uh, Dr. Ahmad. Which position, prone or supine, are safer for head care provider and patient to perform PCNL during COVID-19 pandemic? Dr. Joben, please. Hello? Uh, thank you okay. so much for that question. Before I proceed, I'd like to uh, greet also all the attendees from the Philippines, <clears throat> as well as the other guests from the other countries. So uh, I uh, am very thankful that this question came from Dr. Ahmad. Uh, while we know that uh, prone position is typically done uh, with the patient uh, in general anesthesia and therefore he is intubated and therefore there is a uh, potential for aerosolization as in contrast to supine where majority can, could be done under regional anesthesia. Uh, we in our center actually do not have any uh, problem with doing the patients prone in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, we, we have heard so many discussions on avoiding uh, intubation so that uh, we minimize aeros aerosolization among our patients and decreasing the risk for uh, transmission among our healthcare workers. For one, uh, we en ensure that all our patients are COVID negative. And on top of that, our anesthesiologists uh, are well protected with uh, respirators. Some of them even have uh, PAPR. Our surgeons are also well protected. Uh, we, we also uh, uh, utilize elastomeric mask and some of us also utilize uh, PAPR in order to protect ourselves. Our residents are also given uh, uh, special respirators for this purpose. So even though theoretically uh, supine PCNL is generally uh, quote unquote safer as far as aerosolization, we have not seen any uh, problem with uh, practicing prone PCNL. If you look at our number of cases that we did, we only uh, did supine and I apologize for Tupaxi for you know, doing only one. <laughs> over the pandemic. But the, the main reason for that is uh, we also feel that our learning curve in the supine is still there. You know, we, we just uh, began to do supine over the past few months, but our expertise with the prone is, uh, is so well uh, entrenched that uh, <clears throat> we already know how to do it uh, fluidly without any problems. And uh, our, our anesthesiologists have no have no hesitation uh, doing that in spite of the COVID pandemic. I hope that answers your question, Dr. Ahmad. Thank you, Dr. Joben. Maybe any question from the other speaker to Dr. Joben? Dr. Paxi yes, on I'd the like topic. to listen to the comment of uh, Paxi on that. Because in, in our guidelines, uh, one of our uh, comments is that 
whenever possible, we recommend supine PCNL for the simple reason that it is done under regional anesthesia and uh, intubation could be avoided. But you know, eventually we we began to be juicy among our patients. Uh, so, how, what's your comment on that, Patsy? So. Uh, my, my comment would be, uh, unfortunately, uh, not all of the colleagues have the uh, privilege working in uh, centers like uh, NKTI or in some other uh, big hospital like in Jakarta, in Surabaya, who has, who has a, a good and proper diagnostic tools. For example, in, in, in my own uh, private institution, uh, in pri private hospital, uh, the only screening that we do for the patients are uh, uh, rapid test, no swab. I mean, because the swab test is very limited in, in our country, maybe also in the Philippines. Uh, not all patients could be uh, screened properly. So we only do a rapid test and chest x-ray and a uh, complete blood count. We look at the diff counts and everything. So in my practice, uh, especially in the, in the private hospital, as you know, I only do supine position, and it's uh, benefits of, of not patient anesthesia. So uh, if you ask my opinion, then I would be very happy uh, to say that I still do supine PCNL, and I did supine PCNL for, uh, for many years before, and it's just fit to this pandemic. Um, so whenever patient who are screened and has no reactive condition uh, of uh, of COVID, then we proceed with the surgery in a in a regional anesthesia yep. and uh, and uh, do the surgery. But there are some small numbers that the patient needs to be intubated, and I don't think it, I don't think it's a, it's a matter. It's not it's not about the supine or the prone PCNL. It's about our safety precaution aerosolized uh, uh, condition for the, so I basically, whenever I do a general anesthesia, I, I, I do surgery in general, we do respirator, the mask, the goggles and everything, and uh, understand and, uh, and teach us how to, uh, to uh, behave uh, with this PPE. Even the, if, I just want to emphasize, even we have a proper PPE, but without a good behavior, a proper behavior, that's not nonsense. So, I mean, proper behavior and proper PPE should be, uh, should be uh, mandatory to avoid uh, contamination of COVID-19. Right. That would be my comment, Joben. Thank because, you very uh, much, I mean, like, Dr. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you very Joven. much, Dr. Joven and Dr. Paksi. Now the last question uh, from audience, uh, Dr. Reza Muhammad to Dr. Eka Yuda Rahman. For the renal colic treatment as described on this slide, there is avoidance to use ibuprofen to treat the painful condition on renal colic and already to use metamisol as alternative. My question, how to manage the renal colic condition with a metamisole allergy condition? Any other medication option for that? Uh, Dr. Yuda, please. Thank you, Dr. Besut. Thank you for the question. Uh, for renal colic treatment, we if uh, metamisole is allergic to the patient, we alternative uh, uh, tramadol or combine tramadol with paracetamol, like uh, ultraset or synchronic. If the colic is persistent, we do give injection tramadol. Is my answer, Dr. Busut. Thank you. Andy, any comment from the uh, speaker? Any comment? Any comment? Yeah, uh, uh, this is my comment that uh, see that the first line uh, for the colic pain, we, the, the first drug is an SID. So if uh, the patient, the 
the patient had a metamisole allergic, so maybe we can give the alternatives like uh, ketopropan or something like uh, the clopinac, the, the group of NSID that can uh, relieve the pain uh, for this patient. And if the, well, for this patient, maybe uh, the next step is uh, low dose uh, or uh, Trimadol, and then uh, if the trimadol is not working, and then we the last uh, the last choice for the colic pain or the pain, uh, guided by where WHO is uh, so like a morphine. I think this is my comment. Uh, okay, thank you, yes, thank you very just, much, Doctor Jida. Yeah. Okay, maybe Doctor Fasi, can you comment? Yeah, just just to remind that we have to aware of the. A pain management step ladder from the non-steroid uh, anti-inflammation drugs until the opioid that could be used to 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 take care of the colic. If 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 the colic persistent, then what we have to do is do a surgical intervention to take care of the obstruction. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor Ekayuda, Doctor Paksi, Doctor Tofik, Doctor Joe, and ladies. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, come to the end of today's meeting. Dr. Joven has a comment? Uh, maybe, please. Yes. yes, may I make a short okay. comment? <clears throat> I, yes, I yeah. appreciate the comment made by Paxi on uh, the availability of RT-PCR testing. Uh, as you can see, if you look at the guidelines we have set, we have to make sure that we have the most efficient uh, RT-PCR testing. And that was the gene expert. And it came <clears throat> a little uh, early to the NKTI. We are fortunate to be one of those in the country to have that. We are able to release the results uh, in, a, in as early as 30 minutes, actually. But because of the volume of cases that we have, uh, we are receiving for preoperative cases, the results are typically released uh, within four to eight hours. So therefore we admit the patient typically as soon as the results come in. So we, they don't run the risk of you know, wait, doing a swab, waiting for three to four days before the results come out and easily run the risk of getting an exposure in between before they actually get admitted. So I think that is one way we have been able to streamline uh, how we treat our patients. So we, we know our patients are COVID negative because they had been screened the day of the admission. And once they get in, they go to a non-COVID ward. And that in a way worked for us. We uh, actually have uh, discouraged people from doing antibody testing because uh, as you know, antibodies come late in the course of the disease. They don't typically uh, give us a picture of uh, where the infection is as far as incubation and in infection period. So we do not use that in, in our center. But I totally agree with Paxi. The key is you know, to have that. And it is uh, unfortunate that not everyone has the, the privilege to use that. And uh, for that reason alone, you should go clinical and just protect yourself in the process. That's the end of my comment. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you very much, Joven. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, come to the end of uh, the meeting today. Thank you very much for your enthusiasm and in this session. We are very honored to see us uh, enthusiasm for the speaker and participant. I would like to remind that uh, a certificate will only be given to all participants who attend more than 70% of the meeting and will add feedback uh, from after the meeting. Finally, I would like to thank all the participants who are very actively participating in this live conference. And for the last, please do not forget to kindly fill the online questionnaire form that has been shared. It is very important for us to give us an evaluation of this event. So that we can conduct better event in this future. Thank you very much for the speaker and uh, for the participant. Joben, thank you very much.
nice. <laughs> Maybe we can Thank you. Thank you. in Thank you. offline Thank you. meeting next time. <laughs> Durban, thank you. Good to have you here, man. Thank you, Dr. Dayanto, Dr. Bdai, okay. Dr. Raman. Thank you to everyone in Malang. Okay. We hope See maybe you next, soon. Uh, next year we can go to the Philippines. <laughs> yes, yes. Hopefully, hopefully things are better. Thank you, Paxi. So, uh, best regards to all of the uh, NKTI staff. Yes. I really, I, I, I really I'm appreciate gonna... it. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, bye bye. Appreciate the invitation and the greetings. Bye bye. Good afternoon. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you, Maria, for. Let's see that.